How is everyone tonight? Pretty good. Yeah, can't complain. Are you feeling awake and alert, JD? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. I've I've bought some uh, some of this monster energy drink. Other energy drinks are available. And uh, yeah, it'll see me through. What it will do to my uh, my body, I don't know, but well, we'll see. Doesn't look good. <laughs> no, well, you know, I, some of the ingredients on here are pretty scary. A lot of chemicals I'm not sure are real. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll make do. Wish me luck. <laughs> Hello again. Hi, Doug. We made it. Hey, Doug. Hello, John. Hello, Heather. She can hear us. <laughs> and hello again, Jamie. Hello. <clears throat> Was TJ hoping to make it? Yeah. I don't know if TJ is going to be here or not. I hope so. And Jeffrey was a uh, maybe. All right. I had to take my son's Thomas and friend's lamp to get a decent lighting girl. I would have been in the dark like uh, John David Ebert was before. You know, <laughs> <first few. laughs> that was a kind of look for him. Yeah, he's really cultivated that. So, the look. <laughs> kind of coming out of the void. Yeah. I thought it was a drama studio or something when I first saw your guys' discussions. So John lives in a drama studio somewhere, re records from there. <laughs> or backstage at a theatre. Yeah, that's me, all right. <laughs> well, perhaps one day we'll have a virtual uh, world encompassing us that we'll enter into with our VR goggles or implants <laughs> or what have you. We'll have a real cafe, a real virtual cafe. When the price point on VR comes down, maybe. It seems inevitable at this point. Brings up some interesting things, uh, but let's save those. Some foamy, foamy topics, perhaps. Well, it's just after six o'clock mountain time and whatever time it is, wherever you all are. 11 p.m., I think, Jamie, in the UK. Try 1 a.m. 1 a.m. Oh, yeah. it is 1 a.m. right now. Yeah. 8 p.m. on the east coast of the United States of America. We're on a globe, apparently. It's midday in Australia, I think coordinating our respective times in this macrospheric uh, extension. I thought it was all about space. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're here for the Spheres Reading Group. Uh, the book that we're reading is called Globes. It's volume two of Peter Sloterdijk's Spheres Trilogy. We all know this. Uh, John has elected to lead off the discussion today, and specifically our reading, suggested reading, went up to chapter two. So chapter one was Dawn of the Long Distance Closeness, and chapter two was Vascular Memories. Um, but obviously this is the kind of material that lends itself to jumping around. And I think we're the kind of people that find ourselves to jumping around. Um, however, I would like to suggest a starting point. Um, before, John, you uh, introduced uh, what 
you know, the discussion proper. And that's uh, and that's to uh, invite Jamie. Well, first of all, welcome. Thank you for for uh, joining us uh, in at this late hour for you. And I wonder if you would just introduce yourselves for um, uh, your our fellow philosophers uh, contemplating these globes and um, for whoever is going to watch this. Uh. Yeah, sure. No problem. Okay, um, so my name is Jamie. I'm a postgrad at the moment at the University of Oxford. Um, my background is in uh, politics and philosophy at undergrad, and I'm currently working on uh, a master's thesis uh, that will hopefully get me onto a doctorate uh, on political theory. And it's on about it's currently about the relationship between ideology and social media. And the doctoral proposal is to then look at political ontology in social media. So my first sort of readings of Peter Sloterdijk were as a way of trying to read something about political ontology or about public spaces um, from this abstract place that wasn't somebody who was as left-wing as I was. Um, so I basically went into this consciously trying to read conservative political philosophers because I hadn't read too many. And I wanted to see what they thought about abstract issues that um, are more commonly talked about on the sort of left side of politics. Um, yeah, so Globes is probably the most important of the three books from where I'm standing from, because it's about <clears throat> the macro sphere. It's about sort of the photography of the world. Um, it's about the relationship between culture and history and death and um, society. And these are the sort of, ideas that have political implications, I think, more so than perhaps sort of dyadic structures of uh, bubbles. Although that itself might be a contentious claim. Oh, wait a sec, check your mic. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, yeah. I just thank you for for uh, for the introduction. And I mean, if, if I could ask a follow up like question. Yeah, sure. Um, you're all. You mentioned that you're also writing. Uh, have a novel in, in mind potentially. Does oh, God, yeah. reading relate to to that in any way? Um, I I don't want to say con not, probably not consciously, but I. I do often, you know, go to bed, wake up, have an idea, and then two weeks later find out something I read has already had that idea and I've just forgotten and re-remembered it. <laughs> but I think everyone has that experience with, with creative endeavours and things like that. Um, I, yeah, I think dipping into philosophy and stuff is really interesting for writing uh, fiction. Um, I remember having a long conversation with a friend of mine who's now doing a PhD in English literature, um, and they said they wanted to write novels and things. But they, at the same time, were trying to argue with me about how philosophy is pointless. And I thought to myself, how could... I asked him quite genuine. I think he took offence at the time. I was like, well, then how could you write anything original creative if you don't think that philosophy is useful? How could you write a novel that doesn't at least have some implicit philosophical argument, even if the argument is philosophy is pointless? And at the time, he thought nothing of it. But now he's gone away and done a whole PhD in that conversation that we had when we were drunk. So <laughs> I think that... I think I proved a point there. But. <laughs> well, somebody m mentioned on the forum, um, maybe Doug or Heather, that Sloterdijk had originally approached or thought of approaching these books as a work of fiction, as a novel. And I thought that was interesting because I, I kind of feel like I read it like as a novel. And that's one useful way to read it, actually. Oh, definitely. I wrote in a YouTube comment somewhere during your the bubbles discussions that this doesn't read like an academic work of philosophy. And that isn't meant to be an insult. Um, it's more that it is more cogent as a work of uh, fiction, in my view, anyway. I have a question too, Jamie. You mentioned conservative political thinkers. Um, oh. Is that how you're reading Slaughter Dyke, or is that something else? I think it's hard not to read him that way because I already knew he was conservative going in. If I hadn't known he was conservative going in, I don't think at this point I would have thought him a conservative as much, just maybe someone who um, sort of was a traditionalist or who liked looking back to um, uh, sort of pre-modern culture to see if he can draw from it. Um, 
but yeah, I think in other works of his, um, his essays on the political use of thymus and his critique of cynical reason, which comes before this, I think it's quite explicit that he thinks that sort of liberalism and Marxism have failed and that ideology critique isn't particularly relevant anymore, um, which to me are quite conservative positions to hold, I think. Mm. Um, I think that brings just just brings up the question for me if conservative is the only option if that's the the basis of the classification you know um, I, are you are you much part of the integral world integral theory integral philosophy okay uh, no not really I'll be more welcome to you to tell me about that <laughs> I won't yeah. take up time now but I'd be happy to talk about it more another time just the idea that um, you know, if we have liberal and conservative as kind of a dialectical tension, there might be an integral way to look at Slaughter Dyke as post-dialectical. Maybe not not liberal or conservative, but in some way looking to move beyond that. I think his writing style definitely is has some um, post-dialectical components to it. I have a video I can share that might explain that better <laughs> than I can do. But Yeah. Well, I definitely yeah. think that Slaughter Dyke doesn't fit into the sort of American political lexicon in the sense that liberal conservative to me, for example, like every, in practice, all American politicians are economically liberal and to some extent socially conservative to a limit in the sense of like Sostite's conservatism sort of, to me, comes out of sort of German, Germanic traditionalism and not so much, like I don't think he'd get on and he wouldn't be in a Republican party, for example, maybe, maybe he'd be in the old sort of, Barry Goldwater 70s style but I've, I find it hard to place him anywhere on the American spectrum certainly and I myself mm -hmm. don't fall on the American political spectrum I'm so left-wing I find it hard to stand up so <laughs> I, I don't see anything for me in American politics but it's really yeah that's a really interesting point and I completely agree okay that's that's uh that's interesting so I I, I know we can go further in the political direction, but I think it would be a good time to circle back and to, to John, because John, you uh, wanted to kind of start us off with a, a clean language or a clean question or some, some practice or some kind of bring us into a, into a space. Okay, I'm unmuted. I'm muted. Now I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Doug. Doug, are you there? Hello? I am here. Okay, great. Hello? Um, so Doug uh, contacted me and he said he wanted to do something Can different uh, for this intro. Um, and I was open to new ideas and he suggested that we he said he was enchanted by the text. And so I said, this session to be really useful for you, Doug, this session will be like what? And um, he responded in a way that I thought was very compelling, especially as there are many people here. Jeffrey mentioned he was the writer. He writes fiction. Amy mentioned that just now. Heather, you're interested in creative writing and you're a, you're a teacher of rhetoric. I know um, Marco is a poet. So, um, Doug, do you want to respond? Um, you, you had a very good suggestion. Do you want to follow up on that? Well, we left off with me stating that I would like to lead uh, during the first group, and that was before I had even read anything by Slaughter Dyke. So I had some harebrained idea in my mind about, like, oh, we can do some very creative work here. But... Um, I thought better of that, <laughs> um, but the the creative aspect that I I'm thinking of now I, I I do have a poem I don't know if I really desire to share well, that I, or not but I, well, I I would encourage you um, how long is the poem Can you tell me that? Maybe about a minute or two Okay it's not I've very heard, long uh, I was inspired to write something as well at your because you encouraged that um, It's about five minutes long It's a little It's a series of vignettes. Um, I, I just wanted to make the 
whatever writing we came up with to share with the group has some relevance to the text and that it was triggered by the text. And since you had already been motivated to write because you've been enchanted by the text, I thought, well, great, let's, let's make that happen. So, um, and I was uh, reading this text and I was having a hard time finding anything that triggered me. Um, so I was, uh, until I came to the section where he starts talking about Gilgamesh in Kindu. And I then was very moved by that, uh, that quotation. And then he continues to develop uh, Ale uh, um, the confessions, um, St. Augustine and the, the death of his young friend, um, creating a, a deep crisis. Um, and I, I thought that was some of the most compelling uh, material that I that he's uh, developed so far for me personally. So I I just want to quote something from the text, and then I would like to uh, you know Doug, if you would like to do, go first, and then I could offer mine, and then we could stimulate a an open frame, however way anyone wants to go with this. Does that sound good? Does that sound good? Is that okay? Okay, mm -hmm. getting some nods. Um, this is what, um, I think it's on page yes. 157. Yes, okay. 157. Um, I'm quoting him. Um, let us say then that losing someone must be practiced before the loss exceeds the loser's control. The most important part of all mourning must be completed before the death of the significant other if their loss is not to lead to the petrification of the survivor. Pre-mourning manifests itself as distance, and the amour faux, this advanced farewell, is revoked, as if the joined wish to forestall any possibility of separation for all time. They make each other accomplices in resolve to deny the loved one any chance of outliving their intimate partner. If those at risk of desertion, however, the survivors of the significant deceased are capable of entering traditions nonetheless, it is because they follow the necessity of replacing their great absentees, those whom they trusted first and those from whom they acquired the knowledge. Whoever readies themselves for this compensation accepts their share of the weight of the world. If the world is heavy, it is not merely because most people in historical times slaved away to earn their lives, the heaviness becomes most palpable when people submit to the task of seceding irreplaceable others. So that really moved me. And so um, I had this uh, flash and I just wanted to share this guy with you. Is this a good time to go for this? Um, this is a, a few riffs, a few, a few vignettes. Um, I look after the old people. As we sit on a bench near a lake in the middle of the forest, we sit in silence. Beatrice, an old lady, age 93, on my right, and an old man, Sal, age 94, on my left. It is Independence Day, the 4th of July. Without my presence, Beatrice and Sal might get lost in the forest or trip and fall, or who knows? They might start to make out like horny teenagers. Sexually transmitted diseases is an epidemic among the elderly. And while I muse upon that remote possibility, the great trees bend their branches with the breeze, producing a surf-like murmur the inhale, exhale of the great forest so dark and deep, and a medicinal smell comes up from the damp roots. And I feel a story riding upon that scent, and I want to tune into that ancient story, for the old folks feel it too. The three of us chuckle together as we watch a family of ducks glide upon the cloudy lake. And I imagine that before the public but before the picnic starts, before the gusts of people arrive with fireworks and firecrackers and corn on the cob, I could just take off my clothes and float upon the surface of the lake with the ducks and swans, while the old people turn to each other, lit up from the inside, warmed by the other's well-earned beauty, and remembering something, 
deep kiss while I, independent now, float solitaire on my back with my eyes closed, letting go of form, forgetting everything except the colors like Monet among the water lilies. Two. After lunch, B takes her nap. I lay her out on the bed, fluff up her pillows. She asks me to lay down beside her. I feel a glitch. This is not a good idea. Unprofessional. What would people think? She looks at me with clear blue eyes and says, please. I lie down beside her, follow her breathing, observe the rise and fall of her chest as we soften our boundaries. We are in sync and she closes her eyes, resting on the bosom of the great lover. She opens her mouth as old people do and breathes in a jagged rhythm. My eyes are open, gazing at the white ceiling, my hands resting on my belly, rising and falling, aware of winter, the mind of winter, and feeling suddenly like a virgin as the cloud of unknowing disperses my vanity. Three, my old lady won't get out of bed. I open the blinds and the room is flooded with light. The trees outside are bare. This is the winter of her discontent. Cradling her head in the crook of my arm, I lift the old lady as if she were rising from the depths of the deep, cold lake to a sitting position. I kiss her on the cheek and announce my purpose. We're going dancing. The car is waiting. I have to get us together. No, 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 my old lady resists. Her muscles are frozen as the cold gray trees. I have to get this show on the road, I say. Can't you be a little charming? Of course, she responds. And I notice the corners of her lips and that frowning face begin to twitch. And a smile, I tease her. Can you be charming? But only if it's sincere, the smile. Can that smile that is sincere, where does that sincere smile come from? The smile on her face flickers on and off. I want to create conditions for a sincere smile. I'm afraid, she says with a grimace. Afraid of what? My condition. Her voice deepens like a small craft that has moved from a shallow river into a vast ocean. There is no bottom to that vast ocean from which she speaks. I touch her cheek, lean forward, look into her eyes, blue, blue eyes of a child and whisper, me too. And you are afraid and I'm afraid. And you are brave, very brave. You were the boss, I kiss her cheek. We'll stay home. She rises from the bed, gazed in the hallway mirror, takes a tube of lipstick out of her handbag and applies it to her lips. I put a string of pearls around her neck and help her put on a black leather jacket. I ask her to look at herself in the mirror. You're stunning. She smiles. She is doing me, I realize, a big favor. She is making my life much easier. I will not let go of this old lady to inertia, to the laws of entropy, to wormwood, wormwood. She must dance again. And if she refuses to dance again and stay in bed all day, what will come of us? And this is the last stanza here. Five. A former lover just turned 50, admitted over coffee that his testosterone level is low. His doctor was worried about his sex drive. Tony shrugged his shoulder and we both chuckled awkwardly. I don't like, he said, that we're getting older. Whatever, I shrugged my shoulder too. Then taking a chance, I asked shyly, what attracted us to each other? I mean, you weren't right for me and I certainly wasn't right for you. I sipped my coffee and noticed other people at the cafe were listening. But Tony was silent, embarrassed by my absurd question. I put my hand on his knee and being 10 years his senior, confessed, I want peace and quiet. And when I first saw him 20 years ago, he was so hot, so sexy, so drop dead gorgeous. And peace and quiet was the last thing we wanted. The neighbors complained about our noises at night, the curses, the door slams. I told him about Beatrice's death, how she had dropped into that other world, how I had closed her eyes down, Closing down the eyes of the dead is not like in the movies. Her eyes fluttered open again, and the nurse and I were embarrassed. Has she come back like Lazarus to file a report from the unknowable? The nurse puts the sheet over her head. I made the call to the family, gathered my things, called a cab, got to the train, and an hour later walked through the streets of Manhattan in a daze of the ordinary world of people shopping, running around, doing stupid things to each other. Out of the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of Trump in the newspaper saying something stupid. I see a little girl squir squirming in her mother's arms. Tony remains silent, and I show him a picture of her. I realize that she loves me more than Tony ever did.
and Tony dancing in the club that first time under the disco ball to Whitney Houston or was it Donna Summer so many years ago? It's all so vivid right there. I can reach out and almost touch it, that lovely mirage, that dream of life. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John. Um, You're I, I've never performed poetry for anyone, nor um, do I want to. <laughs> I'll go ahead with this. Um, this was your <laughs> idea. <so. laughs> yeah, yeah. And I apologize, everyone. But um, this this kind of came about, I guess, for me, it, my poetry happened to be that crossword I posted. I don't know if anybody checked it out or even attempted it, but uh, the center kind of pun was uh, what is hanging above, what phrase is hanging above Slaughter Dyke's mantelpiece or uh, fireplace. And it's going to be home is where the hearth is. Um, and that is kind of my summary of what he was getting at at a certain point um, in there. But so I'll read this. It's, it's something I just now put together, to be honest. Uh, the, the ones I, the poetry I wrote beforehand was undecipherable, uh, except to me personally. Uh, this, this used quite a few of the images that he has. Yeah. I really enjoy the pictures. I, I have no depth of knowledge of philosophy, of history. Um, that's what TJ and uh, maybe you too, Jamie, uh, will, will definitely enlighten me uh, on the historical aspect of Slaughter Dyke. But, so, uh, so I entered Slaughter Dyke's academy without the knowledge of geometry. But when approaching his home, uh, walking past the surrounding cemetery, cemetery, he called to me, gave me an amulet key, invited me in. I walked past the atrium, approached his doorway, and turned the key. Portraits from the Titanic and the Liebestrup caught my eye. Music playing in the background, spherically, lyrically spherical. In his living quarters, I felt warm and I felt death. The fireplace was dancing with heat and destruction and life. I viewed this plaque above his mantle with the phrase, Home is where the hearth is. So, hark, we have hearth, we have heart, we have heat. Then, with a wave of his hand, he tells me, have a seat. He tells me a story. We heathens share and discard our bones, alone, alone again and again, until then, the bones surround us and ground us, frame us, searching no more for warm space it is here in this place. Home is where the hearth is. It is a womb with a view. Then, like an arrogant lover, lover he had, <clears throat> after having me hang upon each elegant word, he discards me like a bone, picking a new partner to dance with as I exited his academy. And so I feel that kind of sums up the images, at least, and that, that gives me a good... I hope anybody here and anybody who might be listening in the future will um, see the imagery of what's going on in these two chapters. That's that's my mind in action there. That's all I have to say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Doug, and thank thank everybody for your your active listening. And I hope we've deepened the space a little bit so that maybe we could amplify any of the themes that are most relevant for you. And I would be very interested if we could find out if this reading, if this session, for it to be really useful for you, this session will be like what? And what support do you need? for that to happen? I believe that's a very useful question. And if anyone feels called upon to respond, that would be great. And then we could uh, maybe have an open frame. Once we know what each person, how this session would be useful for them, and they're delivering that information to the whole group, I think we could all organize our behavior and um, in a way that would be most supportive for everybody's uh, reading experience. Um, for this, for me, 
it's just getting a, a chance to, um, I guess it's like being like a, the leader of a course. You know how you like uh, the, the leader of the course like blows the uh, whistle and everyone chimes in and breathes on the same, the same way and sort of finds the tone. And I think that kind of, um, um, that helps me or helped me today to sort of organize myself around what I wanted to present and how I wanted to present, present it and um, start to, to re receive feedback. Um, I do think this is a difficult text for me because it seems so elusive and amorphous and it's much, it's very collage-like. Um, so I found myself triggered by him and sort of writing in that collage kind of way. So I think that's where I feel uh, there is a relationship between what I just uh, read and my reading of, of Schlotterdijk. So, so we can have an open frame wherever you guys want to go with this. I'm very curious about what happens next. Marco, are you jumping in? <laughs> <laughs> I know. So I'm not, well, I, th I feel like uh, the beneficiary of a, cons of a conspiracy. Uh, and uh, I hope I'm using those terms in some philosophically alliterative manner, uh, given our, our reading. Um, you know, there, there's a kind of way to look at this philosophically, I think, as a text that is part of a conversation with other philosophers who are, you know, looking at, in his own terms, in Sloterdijk's own terms, contemplating a totality, contemplating this, the whole, the sphere. So he begins this book with that image of the seven philosophers contemplating a, a, a globe uh, and places this at the sort of origins, you know, of our way of being in the in this globalized world like where we're we're literally right now all over the world different parts of this sphere interconnected by lines telecommunications networks etc i mean this is our actually embedded condition but like what what i think he's doing philosophically is reflecting something about our actual about the actuality of our condition what sort of moves us through it and the poetry and the story I found um, very relevant to the text, extremely relevant to the text, because the heart of this narrative is that, that breath, that spirit, spiritual, I'm going to just call it a spiritual uh, uh, suchness. Uh, I don't have good language for it, but that, that carries through from that initial breath the infant in a womb to the in, in, in from the moment of its existence in a in a relationship you know, with the mother womb placenta and then the triadic relationship with the father and then you know the the kind of explosion of 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 spaces that we inhabit and what i found most um simultaneously touching and disturbing about the reading that we did in, in these past few weeks is that he focuses, and this is not the, to, this is not the whole thing that he does, but he focuses on the element of, of death that, that, you know, that attends to that movement. And so the death is also another facet of an erotic or romantic um, dimension or energy. And, but it's all about the strong relationship. It's all about who we are as people. And I feel that the reading of Sloterdijk that is looking at, uh, looking at him, that, that's thinking that he is making objective claims about the nature of, of reality in the, in the sense of a geometer, even though he talks about geometry, uh, I think is missing the, the point. I think it's missing the mark of what he's actually doing. Uh, I think what he's actually doing is bringing philosophical reflection into, those, into that intimacy 
And he, in his text, is elusive and sort of high, high-minded or expansive. He doesn't get too personally um, invested, uh, it seems. Or at least there, there's something about his temperament or nature as a thinker that keeps him on the cooler side, the aristocratic sort of distance. But then, like the triggering example for, for you, John, the Epic of Gilgamesh, he'll include these um, passages, this artwork, uh, these other these references that are extremely um, evocative. And I found myself particularly moved by his by this section on um, on the long distance closeness and on the way that we are practicing for the anticipated absence of our loved ones. I was thinking about this in particular because I just went on a long trip. I went on a road trip from Colorado to New York by way of Kansas and then to Minnesota and back to Colorado. It took four days to get to New York in a car with my wife, my two daughters, and my dog. And, uh, and then another two days to get to Minnesota, another two days, a grueling drive back, uh, you know, from the afternoon all the way through the night until like five, five in the morning when we arrived to close a distance. The reason I went, uh, and it was to, to see people in particular, though, I went to see my father. And we've talked about, you know, everyone has their own different father relationships. In my case, uh, my father is uh, alive. He lives in New York with my mother and my brother lives there as well. And that's uh, where I grew up. So I intended and planned the trip, I realized, and as I was reading this text, as a way of um, preempting uh, a loss without having had had another experience of seeing him. And, well, that, this is just one, this is like my, my, you know, what arose for me personally in like that aspect that he's, that he's looking at, the way that I, I almost made the trip harder than it needed to be just to make the closing of the distance um, more significant. I don't know if that's what I was doing psychologically or, or what, but what I think is um, poignant for me, like in the text, uh, and where it connects to the kind of philosophical overarching project, is that there is some, and at one, there, there's some founding trauma, there's some founding uh, loss uh, that moves us as human beings to create bigger and bigger spheres, bigger and bigger interior shared spaces where uh, we have that strong relationship. And what I, the, the, if I have a research question or if there's something I'd like to learn through this you know, talk or through this exploration, it's to get, it, it, it's, to, it's to see the connection between the monstrous dimension of what we've really created, like what this civilization ha has become and is becoming, uh, to find the relationship between that and the intimacy. Because part of what seems to be happening is in this monstrosity, there's the, the estrangement that he talks about. We, we're lost in the matrix. We're lost in the acceleration of events, uh, of news. Uh, in your piece, John, you, you know, glimpsing the Trump uh, a bit uh, on your way you know, through these, these um, very, you know, uh, uh, deep emotional landscapes. Uh, and so the, these planes or these spheres are always colliding. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, uh, disturbing. Them, right? um, there's a sense, and I felt a sense of a centrifugality, like people just fl flying apart from each other, uh, fragmentation. And, well, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I would, to close my just remarks here, I mean, what would make this time valuable for me is to uh, um, 
feel closer to other people. <laughs> and, uh, but, but it, you know, but not in a cultish, monospheric, um, narcissistic, uh, kind of self-referential way. Like, I think that's part of Sloterdijk's coolness is to kind of open up a frame, open up the frames, open up the, the enclosures that, you know, we tend to presuppose uh, and that are, you know, problematic in, in many ways. I mean, like the, you know, I'd love to come back to, to Jamie's point as well about uh, Sloterdijk's politics because that has a, that's a strong element in this. Uh, and one of the themes in, in, in these, this month's reading is the wall. Uh, that the, that's obviously you know relevant in U.S. politics, but the sense of where the divisions are, who's inside and who's outside, and where we are in relation to each other, I think is oh, uh, an essential question. Can so. can I respond? Can I ask a question? Mm. Feel closer to other people. What kind of support do you need from our group so that you can feel closer to other people? Well, what what you and Douglas did already uh, is is it? I mean, you shared yourselves, uh, and I gave a, a, a window into the womb from which you have a view, a, a view into your <laughs> into your into your inner sphere. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it's when I listen to people. I often find myself using um, this. This is a complex symphony I've never heard before. So I'm I'm looking for something that I can hold on to, <laughs> and um, I just I'm aware of that in myself. Um, and there are different registers. There are different kinds of voices that are coming through. So I know there's the philosopher in all of us. We want to get rational and detached and as abstract as possible. And then there's also something else going on. Um, and we're often triggered, I think. And um, we don't know how to articulate that and be philosophical at the same time. And I think really good philosophers are sort of like poets in a way. I think there's a, a family resemblance. So anyway, that's my sharing because I, I really feel that uh, I, I want to get the affective and the cognitive in a kind of flow state mm. uh, within my own my own uh, organization, and then hopefully I can uh, support others in whatever does whatever they want to learn or develop themselves. I mean, they may have something totally different they're interested in than I am, but I just think to make that transparent is a, a great benefit to all of us. Because then we can say, oh, I know what he wants, what she wants, and this is how I can support them, or not, if I don't want to. So, but at least I have a, I think uh, the transparency is, is something that allows us then to see through to one another and find those themes and motifs um, that we may not be alert to. So thank you anyway. That's great for me. Thanks. Wasn't sure if Jamie was going to jump in there. I'm just making notes, so I'll come back. Come back to me. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I'll answer your question next, John, because the way you asked it really um, spoke to me um, on a being level. There was something that pulled me in the way you asked it, as though it were personalized for me, which um, is for me kind of like the language of the soul or an experience of the beloved, in which I could hear my own voice. And so what that mediated for me was um, a sense that I need to write more. <laughs> and uh, I haven't, so this almost for a moment morphed into a return to, I was just in an MFA program studying creative writing and then doing workshops. And it was almost a return to that and to that way of being, which I haven't done for like a whole semester now. So one of the things as I was reading is just having this desire to write about the, the crux of what this um, book mediates for me in either an essay form or collage form. Um, not that poetry is out of the question, <laughs> but uh, I was in a cult 
Um, and so whenever Slaughter Dyke makes direct references, I say it's a cult. I mean, some, it might not have been a cult to some people. Um, a friend of mine says that, you know, some things are cults to some people and not to others, but I'd never anticipated that I would be in a cult. And we were told repeatedly that it was not a cult and that we could leave at any time. So this gave me what I really am grateful for in that experience is the ability to make the sphere into an object or the bubble into an object and to really understand the dynamic. Um, for the last year and a half, one of my struggles has been with intimacy and being on the inside of something, um, whether it's a consciousness structure. Being at Naropa, I felt continuously on the outside. And during that time, I felt also excluded from many of my older integral circles of friends. And this was the same time I was leaving the cult too. So I had this crisis of um, birthing, I guess, if we're working with the womb idea here, where I didn't have an aliveness around me that made sense or that I could really identify. Um, I was in a poetic womb, but I wasn't in a, uh, in a warm space that would lull me into complacency. And so I think what I want to really get from this text and I like, the, I like the question very much because um, that is something I'm bringing to it, is a real need to understand how these groups form and become unconscious about their own exteriors and interiors and their walls. There's Jeff, Jeffrey. So, um, yeah, I'll pause there, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to share more. Did you say to understand groups and the, their unconscious process? Could you clarify? Could you repeat that for me? Yeah. Um, so what kept coming up for me as I was reading Slaughter Dyke is Keegan and the embeddedness and emergence metaphor he uses for development. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking a lot about Holons and how that contrasts with Gebser too, some lately. Um, because, well, I don't know. I think my idea of Holons might be a bit naive. But um, your question about... Um, what was the word I said, or what was the phrasing I used again? Holons and Gebser and a need to understand the group and the unconscious. The unconscious aspect of the group. Yeah, so where Keegan came in for me was the, that embeddedness idea that were these living structures that are spheres, are um, things we're embedded in. Just like when we're born, you know, and then we're embedded in the mother's care and then the family unit. And then gradually that embeddedness gets broader and broader. We expand our sphere out. Um, what does it mean? I mean, you know, Derrida has this really interesting work on being outside of community or having a community for people with no community. He was passionate about that. And he was in community with other thinkers like that, like Maurice um, uh, Blanchot, who's a lot like a Bachelard type writer. So these non-linear, non-logical sorts of um, writers. And then for, for Derrida, I share some understandings of this interior, I think, or I want to think that I do, because Derrida grew up a Jewish, uh, grew up in a, a school that he was expelled from very young. He was Jewish. Um, and he got kicked out of his yeshiva or whatever. <laughs> and so he was on the outside of this community. And in his writing, it is so clear how much um, Jewish mysticism has influenced him. And I, the cult that I'm referring to, you know, was with Mark Goffney, who's a Jewish mystical teacher. And so I had all of these Jewish mystical experiences. Um, and yet I could never be Jewish. So I, I, I identify somewhat with Derrida being on the outside and then, the unconsciousness of the group, I don't know really what to say about that yet, other than I, I'm looking at our nationalist um, or populist instincts that have reared their head with the Trump election and looking also into some fascist history that I have not learned the first time around. So thinking about that and propaganda, getting ready to teach about propaganda this semester and thinking about how it perpetuates the bubble. You, um, you yeah. should have been here at our Tuesday cafe. We were working with the Hebrew alphabet. Mm, interesting. Very intense. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to encourage you, if you if you feel an essay or a poem coming through, please post it. Awesome. It. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that would be, be great. And 
if there's any support you need, please let us know what that might be. So thank you. Yeah, I'll stop there then. Thank you. Jamie. I'll any, mute it back in. Is there anything you want to share or a comment or you don't um, have to answer that question if it's not a useful one for you? No, I'm, I'm happy to talk um, if nobody else wants to talk. I found, I found that really interesting um, to talk about being embedded in spheres. Because to me, a, spheres to me in Sloterdijk seem very similar to something close to to resembling an anthropology at the complete opposite scale of Rousseau's um, anthropology, in the sense that uh, for, for Rousseau, human beings were sort of rugged individualists, and there was a pre-political stage, there was a pre-social stage to human development. Um, and then prior to resource scarcity, when we had to basically fall from our sort of Adam and Eve like state and agree on things like property and rules and laws. Um, we lived as individuals. Whereas it seems like Sloterdijk's project is to say that that myth was always purely a myth and that we've always been, even without knowing, um, embedded in each other in social practices. There was no pre-political or pre-social stage for humanity. Um, and the word embedded to me is interesting because it to to go back to what Heather was talking about, to be embedded in something almost is something that is impossible for you to detect. It's attached to your identity and perhaps you don't even notice that it's it's happening. It's and perhaps when you're not in a sphere or the sphere isn't the comfortable experience and it's a jarring experience, is a good sign that perhaps this isn't uh, a sphere in the Slotterdijkian sense and it's something else. It's another sort of um, entity altogether. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can, I've got some other things I've, I've just been thinking. Um, I don't know how much people are interested in or would care to know about the sort of context that Slotterdijk's writing in, maybe in the context of German philosophy or the context of spheres um and i'm happy to talk about that if anyone has <laughs> any please, thoughts or please if and if that's useful for you it would be useful yeah, for sure. us so go for it okay. okay so for me one of the things that's interesting in this chapter is this idea of the mixture between death and culture and this idea of societies as these socio-poetic um spheres um and the idea of culture being this uh, site of memory of the people that have gone before us. And this idea in German philosophy isn't necessarily new. So Hannah Arendt talks about this. So there's a good um, essay by Irene McMullen, where she talks about the um, amnesia of the modern in Hannah Arendt. And Hannah Arendt has this point that in ancient Greek and in pre-modern times, um, history was a very delicate curated operation. We usually had our ancestors as one part of our history or local history and then you'd have the world history that would be kept and it would be a very hand-picked sort of uh, collection of events or things that happened that the community deemed important and Arendt's concern is that in the modern world and the modern world for her is the 1940s um, that the modern wants to archive everything that's happening and she thinks that too much is almost being remembered and that it's hard for anyone to tell what is important and what isn't. And I think that idea is also being tapped into to an extent in a slot of like, and you think now that we live in the world of Facebook and Wikipedia and the 24 hour news cycle, how, how true is this uh, idea? So that's sort of one thing I'd like to, to talk about this idea of um, sort of the, uh, uh, community uh, we... of memory, as it were. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is this might be too politically leaning. This might not really get to what people want to talk about. But to me, Sotterdijk has this weird um, view about spheres developing, and it seems to me that he conflates spheres, philosophies, and empires. So he has this bit where he says that the first spheres tend to develop, and where the first philosophies develop, and that's in India, China, and Greece. And to me, that seems 
relatively dubious. So he cites one book that says that. Um, it's a, it's a, his, his citation is one book that says that, but he says the majority of philosophers believe that. Uh, not necessarily true. Um, and this idea of spheres are necessarily expansionist. They come with walls that wish to physically move outward. And it seems to me to be one denying the idea that nomadic cultures could possibly have philosophy in this sort of spheric sense. Um, it ties communities to a sense of property in place and permanence. Um, and I don't know how far I want to swing it, but it seems to be imp the implication being that sort of em empirical uh, em imperial conquest, rather than empirical conquest, imperial conquest is a necessary consequence of reaching some level of civilization, um, which itself is interesting because you could read spheres as attempting to be a sort of rejection of enlightenment grand theories of history, but itself seems to have this implicit idea that, um, yeah, the, the spheres are expansionist, that, and that seems to be more of a. That's well, he he admits that his account is hyperbolic, but that seemed to me to be pretty hyperbolic to to claim that to be yeah, be true, or maybe maybe not necessarily normatively good, but he thinks it to be true, which is interesting. He does say, "Why is it?" He does ask the question, "Why is it more likely that we have large spheres?" like empires uh, rather than none at all. Uh, but I, but I, just on, just on that point, I mean, I think, I think that that's, um, I think, I think that that's really interesting because there is a ten tension, let's say you can look at it as a, as a spheric, you know, tensile uh, type of, you know, of um, force um, between the notion of the goodness uh, of having an encompassing whole, of being a part of a whole or being a member of a whole with access to all that the whole um, um, provides. It is the container and the sustainer for your life. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, act, the dynamics of, of those holes as they grow and multiply, because historically we're in, uh, you know, we're in a phase we're in a state uh, of social, political, you know, civilizational manifestation where uh, the, you know, the, the kind of simple orbs uh, have collapsed, right? the death of the orb. Uh, and we have this very complex orb, which nobody can really control. Seems to be, though, seems to have directionality seems to be subject to the influence of uh, who, you know, some, an elite or uh, a technology or some other agentic uh, uh, capacity like, that we ascribe. Uh, and there also is this way that we become alienated from our own context. Uh, and that could happen at the kind of microspheric level, at the kind of small group, cultish, uh, or any kind of social group. Uh, but I think it's also happening on social media. Uh, th these places of intense connect connection are also um, causing us to feel further apart, I think. That's my experience. Uh, and I don't know like, like whether, to, whether that is simply a process that is going to play itself out into a kind of you know, entropic, you know, dissolution of humanity, or whether there is some uh, possible kind of hypersphere or some way that that a planetary c civilization, for if if you believe in that, um, can be constituted. Is that what we're we, we're moving toward? Can we choose to move toward that, even in the face of of dissolution? Uh, I think the, I think these are really profound questions. And um, I think that, you know, they, be, they really become meaningful when they reflect on how we live our lives, you know, what we choose to do with our time uh, and who we choose to do it with. You know, that's part of my, my thing is that I want to know people better, but it's difficult because, you know, we're, we're in virtualized, you know, fragmented realities. 
uh, and it's not even clear how to do that uh, anymore in this in this scenario. So, uh, and then you know, go to the political level. Well, if I may interject, uh, uh, hi guys, hey. hi, uh, hey, hi Gal. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so. Just on this idea of the expanding sphere, so that's something I've thought about quite a lot. And um, until the current period, the population has been in expansion forever. I mean, it got smaller in very particular periods of time. So the great, the Black Death in, in Europe was a time when the population was dwindling. Uh, but aside from a few cases like that, the population has always been growing. And right now we're in this particular space, population still growing, but the rate growing is now declining. And that is true for the first time in history right now. So you know, because we are arriving at the finite limits of what the planet can support and it can't grow the way it has been or we're we're going to kill ourselves all off the planet, you know. And so there's this, seems to be this um, mechanism kicking in that is now slowing the rate of growth of the population growth. So it's plateauing. It's not it's still a ways from the plateau, but it's but it's headed that way. Um, so, uh, and Marco, you were talking about you know other planets. Well, it's it's still true that we have to manage our planet first. If we don't, we'll kill ourselves off before we get to the stage where we can start to expand again into other planets. So we're in this critical stage where we've got to manage it, or we're we're goners, you know. So, uh, so the, this idea of expansion as being maybe there's this idea in economics that expansion is always necessary or is intrinsic in the human condition. And uh, Sloterdijk has this idea of is contingent on political on the historical context of these different societies compared to today where the contingencies are no longer the same. Anyway, that's uh, my two cents based on some things that I've done. Can I, it's the population going down in, it's in Europe and I understand in Japan but, and it's probably the United States, but is it uh, uh, around the world or is it just well, in the... Uh, it's not the population that's going down. It's the rate of growth of population, which so people, has been in expansion also all of history. But the rate of growth is declining. The, not the rate of growth, the rate of rate of growth, if you like. It's the, it's the acceleration factor, if you like, so that the growth of the planet is decelerating now instead of accelerating as it has always done. And this is what's new about what's going on. And it's been decelerating since about 1963, Hmm. which is interesting. But this is also localized, isn't it, Jeffrey, to particular countries? Uh, No, it's Japan, the, the, the Nordic countries. These are the countries that are more experiencing the slowing rate of the growth, growth rate. Rate. I mean, the birth planetary. rate. The birth rate is going down. It's planetary. No, the birth rate is not going down. Uh, no, because the birth rate. Yeah, well, if the, the birth rate independently of the population, if you like, is going down, but the birth yeah, rate yeah. times the population is still going up, right? Because the population is big. Mm. Uh, right, but so it more, is the more people it, are having fewer kids later in life. Exactly. And or no kids at all. Exactly. It's yeah. the effect of education as well. So education is much more installed. You know, there are still lots of problems with education, but when education installs, one of the first reactions of that is the population rate of growth goes down. And mm. so the more the world gets educated, the more it goes down. 
right. and we're into this kind of period where the education is there is a feedback going on does that answer your question yes that's a healthy trend wouldn't you say it is a healthy yeah. trend unfortunately yeah. we're also faced with extinction of species extension of you know and all of the environmental things that are going on and you know it so you know, just if we kill off the coral reefs we're going to kill ourselves off you know so TJ, you're here. TJ, good to see you. Good to see you too. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> yeah, like Jeffrey said, the, the train is still going forward. It's just slowing down. And it's not in the Western countries, it's more noticeable, but the bulge is also slowing in the Middle East, in India, Africa. a couple other places, China, yeah. So what happens next? I mean, are we going to have to find another way of enjoying life, finding satisfaction? I mean, usually, you know, having kids was the primary motivation for most people. Um, I, I, I find it through uh, rooting slaughter, I. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but it doesn't mean people are going to stop having kids it's that the rate of birth is equaling the rate of death right so always moving towards it anyway yeah so i mean th this is i mean th the question i th think that you might be pointing to jeff for what we're one direction we could go with it um <clears throat> i don't know if, we'll just i'll just go with it uh, is that there's some management problem, like because there, if you get to a steady state uh, of population and you get the technology good enough and you get the political coordination good enough, presumably you could sustain life on Earth uh, and you know not blow yourselves up, not destroy you know the living matrix, uh, et, et cetera. Um, where, what, what concerns me still, and this coming out of the text, is this sense in which there's something more than uh, a, just a rational you know, kind of perspective on, on the globe going on. And, and that's in that element of uh, the, the kind of founding uh, energies that are let loose uh, with, with a culture that you know, talks for a bit referring to the work of Rene Girard, I believe, uh, on the, the, the murder cults, you know, at the, at the heart of, of culture. Uh, there's this um, need for a sphere to neutralize negativities, the perceived threats, uh, the, you know, foreigners, uh, uh, you know, anything that well, um, brings death too close, right? That, that kind of cuts through the insulation. Uh, and to me, it seems like we're, there's, we're on the balance or a tipping point between some enlightenment uh, and some um, Well, I, I don't want I, I don't want to get too dark exactly, you know, because but uh, some way that the, it could really kind of go out of uh, you know, go out of control even further. Um, and geez, um, that's too dark. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, and it's also pointless to to contemplate, actually. I mean, be, because I mean, it gets into. Uh, it's not point. Let me not say it's pointless to contemplate, but it's not as fruit. It's it's not fruitful to contemplate it so realistically because we don't know, and that's why. I mean, I think I'm I'm interested in the poetic and the literary and the, the fictional accounts because they allow us to inhabit scenarios of what reality might be like. What if we change some fundamental assumptions or actions? It could be like, like it allows us to play with potentialities rather than be kind of caught in the. Uh, dualistic game of trying to figure it out. Uh, I mean, that's, I mean, what struck me about this conversation from the beginning is 
just how kind of self-reflexively complex it is because we're talking about in being embedded in spheres. We're creating a kind of bubble just through our conversations here. We are individuals, but we include each other uh, to varying degrees and varying kind of overlapping contexts. Heather referred to the integral world uh, at one point. Um, Jamie didn't know what that was, so there's not a context there, but I think it's actually a very relevant kind of uh, um, disjuncture uh, because that sense of an integral or that sense of a whole is very directly what Sloterdijk is talking about. And can we form wholes together? Uh, I don't know how that, you know, that, what that looks like from my perspective other than to have conversations about it uh, and you know, name, put the name above the entranceway to some mythical place and invite people in to uh, to constitute what what there is you know what those people bring into it into this space and that's another interesting part of the text um, the way that we bring the there with us here uh, so uh, i'm <laughs> my, my 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 confusion here uh, with the text. He's talking about the orb, and he uses Atlas, and uh, the the orb is something that the Atlas is having to carry on his back, and it's a he's grimacing under the weight of this, and um, the whole idea of from where would you be able to perceive the whole so there's this there's this inside outside conundrum it seems to me that Schlatterdijk is is dealing with um and i'm questioning that because i just came across something that that a, a, a topologist lou kaufman said he says we are observers but we are not objective observers and it seems to me that that's part of this sort of paradox he seems to be playing around with. Um, but I think he's getting, he, he, he seems to restrict himself to the orb, the sphere, the bubble, and I guess the foam, but that um, he seems not to deal with those other topological figures like the Mobius strip or the Klein bottle or the, um, what's that other one? The Limnescape, that's your favorite one, um, Marco. So I think these, um, I may be wrong, but I just feel like he's creating an unnecessary kind of either or a kind of configuration here. That you, uh, and I think this, this quotation from, from uh, Lou Kaufman seems to be aware of the, of the quantum, um, that there's a, the, uh, the, uh, the, the clear subject object divide uh, the, of the of the modern world is sort of um, I, I think we've all been inherit we've inherited that but I think that's starting to break down as we start to uh, absorb some of the, the Einsteinian quantum theory and relativity and all that I I think that's what's happening too I don't know Jeffrey you know more about this than I would but it just seems to me that there are, this is becoming part of more and more people's thinking. So I don't know where he stands on any of this. He's sort of an amorphous kind of collage kind of guy. So I, I haven't found an argument anywhere in this book so far. <laughs> so. Can I just jump in really quickly? On the sphere? Yeah, please help me. What, I've, been, I've been wondering about that too, why he chose um, spheres in particular. And I think, I don't, I, I'm not saying it's random. I just think that in the logic of this kind of writing, choosing something to animate and then letting it go and become more encompassing seems to be um, an aesthetic or a, a device or a mechanism. And um, I'm thinking here of, it's, there's so much of this that's like Bachelard's Poetics of Space, exploring the nest or the live space. There are even, I think, references that you know aren't yeah. cited that really go between the two. And so um, I almost feel like he's doing what Bachelard did. And Bachelard was to me more of a priest in the sense that he was, he isolated the elements, for instance, and did a book on each one and let the logic of that come through almost in a magical sense. So I feel like that's part of Slaughterdyke's method 
but I, I don't want to say I'm not defending it against things he's left out. I just think he could do another series on the Mobius strip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to discipline I don't myself really because I understand Johnny, how, where you see the relativity coming in, but uh, cause he doesn't talk about relativity. Or, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. I was just saying Lynn, Luke Hoffman seems to be very aware of this. Um, and that, that we are not objective observers seems to under, relate to this um, quantum kind of reality where the subject and object um, are very um, co-specify in a way, but not in a way that uh, turns into an either or kind of proposition that seems to perplex Schlotterdijk. And I don't know why he's so perplexed because, you know, you can, you can always go to a Klein bottle or you can go to a Mobus strip and you can uh, use those as analogs that I think are very much more imaginative uh, possibilities could start to emerge than from this kind of orb globe um, um, sort of dichotomy. Although I have to say, foam is neither or. They're collections of orbs or globes, right? So he does, but we haven't got into the foam discussion yet. <laughs> That's coming, yeah. So, so there is a kind of way out of the of the of the cage of the sphere. Yes, right, right. I think there is a way out. I just don't know that he's addressed that yet. Mm. He wants to, you know. He may be doing something else. It's, you know, like Heather was saying, like Bachelard, he he's uh, creating a kind of um, he 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 creates this con these constraints, and then he works within those constraints to produce something interesting. Um, and um, so, yeah. I think what maybe I that's a good way of looking at. At Schlotterdijk, he's maybe not out to solve any problems here. One of my Just, favorite quotes from the vascular memories chapter is something he mentions about uh, the Alfred Tomatis guy. Uh, but he, he says Tomatis has this unique and instructive ability to exaggerate um, when he's talking about uh, the mother remains this expanded uterus and then this later becomes the hut. But I, I feel Slaughterdyke is talking about himself there. He has this unique and instructive ability to exaggerate. And that that's what he's doing in, in a certain sense. And at times I feel like this these books are not long enough for what project he actually wants to achieve. Um, like we, we all here want to get to the point. We want to get to what what's the solution to globalization? What's, where are we going next? But um, I, I feel that he, he hasn't examined enough that even though he spends 70 pages on examining one mosaic that doesn't have any words, it, he's examining a, a seven guys examining a sphere or spending another 70 pages uh, about a kid blowing a bubble or something like that. Uh, I feel at times he, for this project to be successful in my mind for him, um, which it, it will come in the future as we keep noticing, but I feel like he, he could have really expanded upon this in a certain sense. And I, I do really appreciate the slowness to it. And it's so frustrating at times, but then at times it's so magical and so enticing. And I, yeah, that's, just, well, I like I, I like this book better than the first one. Maybe I'm just getting used to him, but it seems like to me he's much, he's less amorphous and vague and enigmatic. He's still all of that, but just not to the same degree as the first book. So um, I'm finding myself going with the flow much better. And, um, and also maybe the curmudgeon is the yeah, two. I can <laughs> see that. <laughs> Well, isn't there something to his conservatism, though, that is connected to this spherological idea? Uh, and, you know, how we relate to globalization, uh, you know, what comes next? Uh, 
I'm there, not even there, sure there's... of the date of this publication. Did we ever find that out, TJ? Do we know when this was published? I think it was about 1999. Oh, yeah. okay. So this is. I mean, in, in German, of course, the translation didn't come out till till recently. Right. So this is pre 9/11. Yeah. Right. Well, that makes sense. That why he's so amorphous. And... Uh, but but the, but there's no urgency here, and that makes sense. I think after 9/11, a lot of people got very. Um, serious <laughs> feeling. But, but globalization was a part of a, you know, like this is something that people were really talking about. This is also would have been after the the, the Berlin Wall. Uh, so there, there's a sense in I think he's addressing issues that have now become ripe, but that were already uh, relevant then. Uh, they were. And, they were. Everyone and, was talking about. It. Yeah. And I mean, this conservatism to me, I, I, I want to be careful just using that word because I, I don't want to imply something specific that Jamie, you might have in mind that's different than what Heather has in mind or American context versus British or German context. But if we just look at it from the morphological or philosophical perspective, a sphere is a conservative form. Yeah. It's meant to conserve what's within it and it's meant to keep what's out, you know, what's without it on the outside, but it's also meant to mediate between between those. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's incredibly relevant, I think, to inquire into where the, that that passageway, what, what what that membrane entails, and where those membranes are, because they're they're operative at every level, right? And that's part of I think his point is that there's a continuity from the intimate spheres, from our homes, our hearth. The 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 you know, the way that we constitute our day to day lives and these macrospheric globalized conditions like we can't disconnect them like that they there is a continuity and I think part of what he's doing in the books is tracing that through these different scales and the problems therein uh, because some of what we can experience on the intimate scale uh, some aspect of it has to be has to be uh, um, you know totalized. Uh, for the society to work. Uh, but that process of totalization is at the same time alienating. And so part, I, I feel like he wants to balance, or at least if I could learn something from this text, it would be about the balance between like uh, a, a necessarily, a necessary constitutive sphere and the dynamism that, keeps that sphere from becoming a reified form that ins that uh, has to perpetuate itself through violence or through uh, ecological destruction. Well, uh, what I'm, the, the, qu the quote that I came up with at the beginning, he, he talks about pre-grief, that every relationship has pre, you have to grieve for that relationship because eventually that person's going to die, or you're going to die. So we can ignore that as much as we want to. But it seems to me he's advocating that culture is stabilized if there are enough people who can pre-grieve, because then you make better choices, I assume, and more intimacy can be established um, when you accept this. And since he wrote this in 1999, I think there's been a whole movement around the Anthropocene. And we're not just grieving for grandma or grandpa or our parents or fear for our children or our community. We're talking about the whole thing, you know, the whole uh, enchilada here, <laughs> you know? the whole species, our, our species and all many other species. So I think that's a lot to pre-grieve. Mm -hmm. I understand there's a lot of dystopian uh, writing. And I think a lot of it is, is motivated because let's not, let's not let this happen. So let's get dystopian in order to change something dramatically. To, uh, but I think pre-grief is sort of built into this dynamic. Um, so... That's what I'm taking away from this text. Uh, and I, I think this particular chapter was very compelling because he traces the grief of uh, 
the, the um, Saint Augustine and um, and Gilgamesh, and these are such uh, primary figures. And they were these were young men who were grieving for uh, other young men they were in deep relationship with. Um, and I think they're like uh, pivotal figures in in, the, in Western canon. But I think there's also um, like the there are other kinds of grief as well, uh, like the relationship I had with my my friend Beatrice. I was responsible for her care, and I I tried to stay have good boundaries and keep her at at, at a distance because I knew it was going to happen. She's ninety four years old, but I still you know I fell in love with her anyway, <laughs> you know? and I don't I don't. And I, I think that's there's something liberating about that, that I could be with the love and the grief at the same time. And it was rather unique in my experience. Um, but I don't think I could, but I think that's something that, you know, we all have to come to term, terms with the best way that we can. But I do think it's very important for culture to get stabilized around more mature kinds of love than perhaps our, uh, our, our, our pop culture is is willing to uh, explore because we all love Romeo and Juliet and that kind of schmaltzy stuff but anyway that's my two cents <sighs> I have to go folks I'm sorry I, I uh... <laughs> good so to good see to you. see you Jeffrey it's good to see you nice to meet you Does anyone else want to go or shall I Please jump do. in? Okay. Jump in. So I wonder if I could try and be provocative here in the sense that I want to try and argue and be, feel free to argue back at the end that this is actually quite a small book. And I mean that in the sense of I think the, if we understand Sloterdijk in this context, this sort of historical and political context, the vision of the book, um, actually belies something which is actually quite a small important point to what he's trying to achieve. So we, ha we talked earlier about his conservatism and sort of how that relates to spheres. And to me, I think he's trying to create this universal sort of alternative. I think it's Geschichte is the word, like history of ideas or like a, the way that histories of ideas can be conceived or something. I can't remember the exact translation of that. But he's trying to pr produce an alternative vision of how societies form and sustain themselves. And the reason this is important is not necessarily because of 9-11 that was mentioned earlier, but because of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And at this point, he is attempting to argue that there's a crisis of national identity because of the, there is now a new unified Germany. And sort of this, this sort of essayistic point is, how do I make the case for a national identity rooted in place and rooted in identity and commonality after Nazism, after uh, East Germany, after sort of the grand narrative of the 20th century. So I think for me, the more we step back and see this as a hyperbolic literary enterprise that's trying to talk about the world and the future of the human race, to me it seems that he's talking in these terms to talk about something that he perhaps wouldn't be able to articulate directly, which is this idea that there needs to be some idea of Germanness that can hold these two uh, sort of fragmented parts together again uh, in this context. And then you can sort of see how this idea is what's got him in trouble later in life, because you see that, I mean, Sotterdijk, if you don't know, is like, I mean, a lot, he's quoted a lot by Alternative to Deutschland, which are pretty much like the neo-Nazi party in Germany. Um, and uh, he gets in trouble a lot for some pretty like horrendous comments about women and their like place in the home. And uh, he's said a lot of stuff about um, the problem of Islam integrating into Europe and a lot of like generic sort of reactionary comments on television. And also this idea of the universal um, position inside the sphere. I think uh, John mentioned it earlier, this idea of if you're in one sphere, you're looking at another sphere. Yes, you're outside of that sphere, you can make your comments, but ultimately you are embedded in, in one yourself. And at this point, Peter Sloterdijk is a, well, he's a millionaire. 
he's on television every week in Germany. He's a popular celebrity. People will spot him on the street. And if you go into like spoiler alerts for phones, but his problem isn't a problem of false scarcity or capitalist crisis. His problem is how do we deal with abundance? But of course, most of the world doesn't have the problem of abundance. That's uh, right. Yeah. It's very much sort of a Eurocentric vision of the bourgeois subject. What do we do now that we have all this stuff in our house, houses? You know, and in the you know, mid noughties, this would have been a problem that the middle class of Europe may have had, but obviously this is pre crash. And post crash, Sloterdijk has sort of become not an irrelevance, of course, but in German television, he's been replaced by another philosopher. Um, his writings tend to sort of ramble about um, capital, but not understanding it. And to me, maybe it's because I'm such a good Marxist, perhaps maybe I'm more Marxist than I thought I was. But to me, he says, all the grand narratives have failed. We live in late capitalism. Well, the world is so confusing and scary, isn't it? We need a new way of understanding the world. And to me, I'm thinking, well, there's a lot of explanatory force to be had in just historical materialism. Um, you don't have to believe it's science in the way that the Soviets did or the Frankfurt School perhaps did. If we're going to create literary ways of understanding, you know, mass inequality and deal with problems like climate change, you have to say, well, what is the explanatory force of using spheres as opposed to using ideology critique or you know, other things we can take from sort of uh, the Marxism, post-Marxism of the 60s and 70s that he wants to rally against. Um, what else have I got here? That's, that's oh, yeah. great. That's great, Jamie. Thank you. That helps. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I had this intuition that you're sort of fleshing it out for me. I am to please. Yeah, I mean, what, what well, well, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I want to make, you know, I, I want to make sure, I, I want to actually say it a lot, re reply to everything that everybody is saying, um, but I, I want to make sure that I, I want to hear Heather, TJ, uh, especially what each of you, Doug, who haven't maybe spoken as much, uh, have to say because, I mean, I think that is kind of provocative. Um, At the end of chapter one, this quote stuck out at me. I think it's page 186 of my translation. I can read it. The distinction between forms of peace set off the true world war. On one side, the world historical struggle over the antithesis between power, rootedness, assertion, apparatus and culture, and spirit, uprooting, resistance, anarchy, and art. If there were an end of history, one would notice it in the expiry of these oppositions. And what Jamie just said. Literally kind of got it underlined. <laughs> <laughs> you underlined it. <laughs> I underlined it exactly where you began. <laughs> as well. uh -huh. yeah. Which is really interesting. Because it's Jesus. Where are you setting the borders? Where are you setting the boundaries? How permeable are they? How permeable are you comfortable with them being? Can you expand them? All those kinds of questions. And he's kind of implying that, that those oppositions won't go away. So, so Jamie, this sounds like he's like bourgeois scum, right? But why are you... And you're a Marxist, so and you sound like you, you're already into foams. So what motivates you to stick stick it out with this guy? Um, because it's <laughs> no, your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> your enemy but, well, I think this this aspect of um, a lot of political ontology is explicitly. I mean, I've got ag agonistics right here, for example. A lot of um, what was that? Oh, this is Agonistics by Chantal Mouffe, which is a really good book. I recommend this Oh, cool. One. I, I don't know that. It's called cool. Agonistics, Think, Thinking the World Politically. Maybe we should read it after. Who knows? Um, but a lot of that stuff is explicitly sort of introduction. First sentence is usually like, we all believe in sort of a left-wing emancipatory project that can't look like anything from the 20th century. How are we going to achieve it? And I thought, well, are there any political ontologies out there that don't have that normative goal, that maybe there could be something that can be not salvaged, obviously, but there's, 
that can give me another look on this because at the moment political ontology literature especially is almost exclusively radical democratic theory almost exclusively sort of left-wing people without labels um, arguing over the meaning of certain specific essentially contested concepts and I thought well I'd like to see if there are any other broader ontological or um, sort of uh, anthropological projects that are out there that don't necessarily want an end to hierarchy or don't necessarily uh, want uh, an end to capitalism uh, or yeah so it's quite interesting to read Sloterdijk because for a start he completely believes in climate change and he he's really concerned about it he's concerned and addresses capital as if it exists because one of the main sort of uh, functions of a lot of right-wing criticism is to deny the existence of capitalism or real capitalism or anything like that um, and he is sort of communitarian he cares about uh, community structures and a lot of that to me uh, I mean those are the three big things which I think we should all be concerned with regardless of where we fall in the political spectrum and the fact that he's addressing them um, is something that I find particularly interesting um, and I think going into this project knowing that he said a lot of stupid stuff and then going wait a minute this is not just this isn't a Donald Trump figure this is a guy who's written you know 5,000 words of a literary philosophical work that is perceived as one of the greatest ever written and Critique of Cynical Reason, which he wrote, sold over a million copies in Germany, which is like, you know, what the, this, pro this is a bestseller and this probably sold about 10,000 copies. So there must be something here that, you know, explains, not explains away his sort of, sort of verbal indiscretions, but there must be something going on, which in his mind justifies a lot of them, or at least because a lot of the times he'll be criticized and he'll go, oh, no, no, it's all in spheres. Once you read spheres, you'll understand why I said that thing, which isn't particularly nice. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to read Spheres actually, because <laughs> uh, once I've read this cover to cover, I'll be able to, you know, take you to task, as it were. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank, thank you. Matt, Heather, what does that have to do with post, what, what you call, with what you earlier called post dialectic? Is there some, I think there's a, there's a relation, but so. Yeah. So that quote that TJ pulled out, I also highlighted, and that's, um, to me, that's a post-dialectical statement because it's about the end of history here is the end of this narrative of progress that defines history through tensions like the Hegelian dialectic that the Marxists turned upside down to make dialectical materialism. Um, and that that's what drove the Nazi ideology as well, this sense of this dialectic that was moving, at least as I understand it anyway. I don't, I'm not well-versed in these things, but... So what's the logic that comes after dialectic? Um, I think there are several thinkers doing this kind of work. Edgar Morin might be a prominent example. Um, he's looking at the re-inclusion of the excluded middle, the law of the excluded middle, which is a reference to Aristotle. Um, and I, I think of this as in a similar kind of way. Um, but that doesn't mean I can excuse what he's saying, Slaughterdyke is saying on German television. So you've got my curiosity, really. <laughs> I'm, I want to research it because um, I, I caught in here the moment where he talks about hierarchy. It's like an apology for hierarchy. And his definition was really interesting. I'm not going to be able to find it amongst my other notes right now. Um, I think it was in vascular memories. So to me, this sounds like, and this is one of the reasons it brought up, I'm going to put a link in the chat field here. Rob Smith gave an address at the recent uh, Integral What Now conference, and this is Ken Wilber's Integral. So um, that would be one type of integral. There are multiple, <laughs> some of them more post-dialectical than others. And um, the holon is another type of sphere. Uh, so I've been kind of thinking about that. But in Rob Smith's talk that he gave, Never Been Better, Never Felt Worse, it kind of captures that idea of the end of history. And from what you were looking for, Jamie, which was a, um, you know, uh, something having to do, I, I, I wrote it down, but can't find it now, about um, capitalism. Rob Smith is definitely coming from a conservative position. He doesn't represent all of Integral. He is a, a figure um, in the Wilbur Integral world. That's, he's a leader, I guess, executive director of Integral Life. But um, so he represents a conservative perspective, can't be generalized beyond him, but it was a really interesting talk. So I'd be curious to get your reaction to that. Um, okay, I'll check it out. 
yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I said much there, Marco, but. <laughs> well, I mean, there's this idea that um, I'm getting this from a fellow named Eric Weinstein, that uh, it's not, uh, you know, communism or socialism that's going to kill capitalism. It's technology uh, because, and you know, what, uh, the folks who are in the real you know, positions of, of power with respect to creating the technologies that are um, you know, coming online faster and faster are ten- tending to believe is that like, almost any behavior that is repetitive, that can be scripted in some way, will be ultimately replaceable by, by um, machines. And so, I mean, to Jeffrey's comments earlier about the population, that, that, uh, in, that's very important uh, because you can't have, you know, five plus seven billion people, 10 billion, I think, by 2050 is, is the pr- projection, uh, and not an economy for them <laughs> where, where they, you know, can have, do a job. Uh, so we have to rethink what it means to work in a post-scarcity kind of economy. But more than that, we have to rethink what power is because uh, the the real power is in who controls the technology. Uh, And uh, there is not a, uh, uh, let's say, a a, a close correlation between uh, existing political structures, the democratic ideal of, uh, of those, at least, and the actual distribution of power in, you know, techno-economic, you know, capitalism. So if that's a trend that's going to play itself out and, you know, as it seems to be going and not just kind of pull back and from the edge, uh, well, I, I think that you know, we have to rethink what it means to be human in, in the world, uh, yeah. essentially. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, I can I just follow that up or do you have more you want to say there? No, uh, please. Okay. So um, I taught a class on the human digital crossroads and we explored that question of at what point, because we looked at the pro- likelihood of the coming basic income and that's a conversion to a different world economic system. You know, it, it seems likely. Um, I think we're, it's not that we're going to uh, work with the logic of the old economic systems, but we're going to evolve or move into something different. And can we understand that with our old political ontologies? Um, But this idea of where does the human uh, meet the technological, like uh, my students brought up examples like um, performance art, for instance, you know, can that be done compellingly with AI or is there something human about art? that imbues it with power, you know, this idea of animation in this book might be another example. Um, And I was thinking too recently about how the Marxist definition of work, how much of that is about this post-industrial idea of the human. Um, A lot of what I understand, and, and so Jamie, you could inform me about more current thinking on Marxism maybe, but, or in Marxism, but, um, you know, if the, there's the worker, <laughs> um, but we don't have work and that's not the, not a required thing for exchange. Um, yeah, I don't know I, I, what happens to the Marxist project, I guess. Um, that's interesting. Um, well, I'll again, it comes... One. Go on, go on, you're right. Well, I'll just one more idea. Uh, Baudrillard has the idea of fractal fractal use. So he's he hypothesized that after um, or fractal value. So after use value, which I think is a pinnacle of Marxist thought, Baudrillard hypothesized fractal value would come after that. So that's just another thought. Yeah. So I mean, I think that a lot of a lot of stuff about Marx is sort of blended together, and a lot of modern ideas about Marxism are sort of attributed retrospectively to him. Marx's idea of sort of the labor theory of value and exploitation is actually pretty dry. Um, he's not even necessarily against inequality. He's just against a specific kind of economic exploitation, which is that if you make eight hours worth of products, you will necessarily be paid less than eight hours so that profit can be extracted. 
essentially. So in a world where, um, you know, people, the abundance can occur because of machines and we don't need workers, the question would be, well, um, who owns the machines, as mentioned earlier? And this, this, the thing that Marx has a problem with is the relationship between um, the hierarchy between sort of proletarian class people who basically do you own the factory or do you go in the morning to the factory to work but that can still apply to us now i mean for example if you own a business and you have people under you for example you're working to benefit the business but the business is the people the shareholders as it were um so as as long as that contradiction is in place as long as that inequality is sustained then even things like ubi become a problem because if you give everybody a universal basic income you could just raise the price of everything overnight. If you've maintained a neoclassical economic system, you could then be like, right then, okay, you go to the shop and suddenly a can of Coke is 10 quid because you know everyone starts with $20,000. Um, and then they have, the system would reproduce itself as long as there are people who, for whom there are interests. I should say that I'm not like, I don't necessarily, I'm not a, I'm not a full Marxist, but I knew know enough about Marxism to tell you what a full Marxist would believe. Um, so I don't believe in the theory of history, for example. I don't, I have broader commitments to egalitarianism than say Marx would. And I'm very skeptical about like the tactic of vanguard parties and, you know, violent revolution. Um, but yeah, I mean, technology, to go back to the point about technology, I mean, Marx literally writes a letter where he says, now we have trains and we can move around the earth with the power of trains, there's nothing stopping proletarians from rising together and getting rid of the capitalist system. You know, there's nothing stopping us now that we can move around and, you know, now that people can read and read newspapers, there's nothing stopping us, you know, technology. So like this idea that technology will end capitalism to me, I'm like, well, that's what, yeah, Marx thought that, Hegel thought that, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's, we've always thought technology would solve our problems, but as long as technology is still a consumer product, as long as technology still is used for, I mean, most technological innovation usually comes out of the military side of the public sector, for example. It doesn't usually come from private innovation, which, again, is another bizarre irony of the, the free market. Um, and then on Baudrillard, I mean, I don't, I don't really have much to say on Baudrillard. He's the guy who went to Disney World, right? That's, that was his whole thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't really know his work well enough to comment on him. He's another right. supposed conservative, if you're interested. <laughs> I'll talk him out. I thought he was just more of a nihilist, wasn't he? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know what anyone else thinks about that. Well, if we have a universal basic income, then everybody could be uh, consumers. Uh, if we're being driven around in self-driving vehicles, we could always be online. Uh, nothing be restricting us from you know constantly participating uh, in whatever economy or whatever media sphere uh, is set up. Uh, You'd hope so. And I'm 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 you know I I I find my I find myself between the kind of dystopian and the, um, uh, the kind of uh, absurdist appreciation like how I you know how I stop how I learned to stop worrying and, and love the bomb. Like, do I need to just love <laughs> you know the singularity or whatever is going to happen um i don't know but it is probably it's getting late uh we're, we usually go 90 minutes uh and we've gone a bit further but i'm glad we did because it was such a weird talk in a certain way like we were all, kind of all over the place between the intimate and the personal and the poetic the political you know the, the philosophical um and I, I, somehow I, I feel like we've kind of maybe, at least I feel that there's some cl greater resolution or clarity. Uh, I feel that. Um, um, but um, before we close, if there's anybody who wants to add, n not necessarily to the, the piece on capitalism and um, you know, dialectical materialism or, or, or what have you, but whatever, just on the on the piece as a whole, John, uh, you, know, you might wanna you might wanna well, I'm, to whatever you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm pleasantly overwhelmed. You know, it's nothing. Um, I find myself um, 
taking in a lot of information and having gut feels about it. And then I also find myself, you know, drifting quite a bit uh, in this sort of postmodern smog. (laughs) And uh, sometimes it clears, you know, and I can see through it. So I, um, I've certainly enjoyed the conversation and I feel uh, it's been very sobering. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for putting up with me. It's been a really interesting, uh, I mean, the fact that I'm, I've maintained consciousness is pretty. Uh, wow, it's amazing. So it's like keep asking three me in the morning about. over there, right? It is, it's, yeah, it's coming up. I'll let me yeah, it's two fifty-two a.m. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for persevering. So we're you. like, will universal will basic income work? I'm like, uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe. Let me check my dreams. <laughs> yes. Thank you for really enriching the conversation, Jamie. I feel like um, your provocative statements really help me see things outside of the sphere. (laughs) Yeah, well, I think that when everyone's saying this is a massive project, the thing to say is it's a tiny project. If everyone says it's enlightening, say it's, you know, it includes. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that's, I think it's helpful to think in sort of extremes back and forth because, you know, horseshoe theory, be somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. The angel of silence is passing over us. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to go to sleep, I think. <laughs> Have some good dreams. Yeah, what does any what does everyone else think? about the chapters in general. It's like a summary, I suppose. As a philosophy of history, Slaughter Dyke isn't saying anything yet that's so very controversial or very novel. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with Jamie on that too. We'll see where he, where he takes it, but you know, um, a lot of this is Spangler. I'm glad to see that he's made references throughout. I mean, I, I thought I was behind, so I'm actually about to start chapter four. So the next, um, especially chapter three on arc and city walls is going to be very interesting um, for some of the points that were brought up. Um, communities. I, I agree with the uh, point that was made earlier about um, Rousseau not being accurate. You don't just start off as these monads as, as human beings. We start in communities. It's just kind of, we're, we're already embedded in, in um, I don't want to say spheres, but I guess we're embedded in something, some kind of container. And that just kind of, I decided Lee Soderdijk is looking at this on each level um, from the micro to the macro. Um, finding it, he's, he's said some interesting things, said some interesting things, but they just kind of more tie into some things that I've I've already encountered. Um, Spangler, Toynbee, Gellner, Louis Dumont. So he's has, you know, hasn't rattled me yet because I'm, I haven't heard anything yet that he said. That's like, Oh, what, what's that? What (laughs) so different. Uh, don't have much to add other than um, history, which is why I appreciate you're here, TJ and Jamie and anybody else that knows about history um, and politics have completely been out of my life. So this, I, I can tell he's approaching a point where he's going to be jumping into more of what you guys are wishing he would talk about, or at least you can criticize. So I'll, I'll appreciate those discussions when they come. <clears throat> but I did thoroughly enjoy these chapters uh, for the just the poetic quality. The it, it did take me into the realm of not necessarily the archaic, but the the prehistoric man uh, type of mode. Um, so I, I tend to embody the reading more than try to extract and and reference 
everything else I've read. Uh, so I've really sort of lived this, these chapters and, um, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thanks for your crossword puzzle. I haven't filled it out yet, but I, I, I haven't it. seen this crossword puzzle. <laughs> Is it posted up there? I, I couldn't find it. It's it's on the thread. Yeah, okay. I printed I'll it look, out. I'll look it up. Uh, Try it out. It was it was a lot of fun to create, surprisingly. It was almost like creating a poem in a way. Um, yeah. And please kinda, post, post, feel free to post anything you're reading that's of interest to you that you mentioned Jamie Agonistes, Agonistics? Yeah, Agonistics. By Chantal Neuf. Yeah. Okay, that's great. I'd like to check that out. So, if anyone finds something they're reading that they think is relevant, please feel free to post it on the forum. And any other comments? The best thing about Neuf is that she's an incredibly easy read, but talks about really complicated things. So, it's a great way to sound intelligent at dinner parties. <laughs> we all need help. All yeah. Help yeah. <laughs> I just will end with a thought that, um, so I have some friends who think of poetry as political, being a full-time poet and speaking in poetic ways, which might seem pretentious, <laughs> um, can disrupt ordinary consciousness. And so I'm wondering about Slaughter Dyke's project of evading factual in favor of the more poetic, and if there's a politics to that method or a disruptive quality. I like yeah. that. that. That's good. I think, John, too, you, you kind of um, enacted that kind of move reflexively uh, at the beginning of this talk. I, I felt jarred by your piece about Beatrice because it was so, uh, and you, I know you've talked about this relationship before. I have a little background context for it, but uh, it was a real work of art. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, in my, as I was immersing myself in this book and this text over the last, say, you know, a couple of days, like, um, uh, I, I went into philosopher mode and I really wanted to understand his art, the whole structure of his, of his piece. And there, there was those direct connection points between the, you know, his writing on, on, on death and on the, the way that the injection of death, you called it a, a steroid. Uh, the the monstrous he called a steroid for spherical growth, but so I can make that ph philosophical connection, um, but it, it's uh, it makes uh, um, I think it, it it it's moving in this uh, um, I'm struggling I'm gonna struggle for a little bit for words here, but these like interstitial spaces, let's say like the spaces between spheres almost uh, or the spaces between inside and outside. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, uh, that, that's an interesting place for me particularly because one of the kind of core, you know, tr uh, tribulations that, I, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm experiencing is around writing is around bringing forth um deeper expressions uh, and finding the space for those because you know, often it seems that we have to you know, be in the world uh, in a way that doesn't let us kind of recreate the world uh, through our imaginative play and through our, you know, our uh, self-opening, self-disclosure. So um, I appreciate that. that uh, I, I didn't mean to be disruptive. Um, but I do think it's, we do need to register some of these perturbations. And um, I believe we can, through efficient trances, create conditions for novelty and innovation. And I think that's what poetry is for. Um, and there's good poetry and there's bad poetry. <clears throat> um, so I don't think it's just to, there, you can be very obscurantist, you know, and I think that, uh, but I'm, I'm all for, there are unhealthy trance states. And I think we're full of 
couch potato trance, trance states where we sort of numb out or zone out. But I think we can use trances and um, as learning, accelerated learning events that can be shared in a group. And um, so I would really encourage anybody, if you have a riff or a vignette or something you want to unpack to use the, 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 the space that's been provided for, for that. Uh, I use it a lot, and so some of us do, and I think it really stimulates us for or sets the stage for the next conversation. So, yeah, thank well, you. One of the things about the poetry is it's, it's I mean, be almost by definition non repeatable. Uh, if it can be scripted, then maybe it's not poetry. So poetry may be our only hope in the in the post scarcity, you know, post singularity world. Yeah, maybe. I think that's uh, something that sort of like teaches us, isn't it? Really, there's a fine line between sort of political theory and sort of and clarifying concepts and producing concepts and and that sort of literary, well, sort of poetic but, side. But the uh, the political always revolves around affect and gesture and voice. That's how that's who gets elected. You know, it's how they mm. can. And I think that's something that, you know, I'm sure Schlotterdijk is aware of. So uh, I think we should be extremely alert to that, how affect drives us. And then we come up with all these elaborate theories and meta theories about those affects. So, you know, I think blending the affective and the cognitive is extremely crucial for the, the, the new humans. <laughs> We're going to come forward to use this technology in a creative and innovative way rather than being sucked into nefarious schemes by people who have very narrow views. Um, anyway, I think we're all alert to this and are doing the best that we can. And we should use all our knowledge, use all of it well. And, uh, I'm very much into this transdisciplinary impulse. I know that's a buzzword, but I think there's, uh, I'm not an expert in very much. But the few things I am expert in, I'm very aware that I look at the, the public discourse and realize they're misrepresenting this. And so I know there's a lots of stuff I'm not an expert in at all. I'm being totally bullshitted <laughs> you know, by people who are being paid a lot of money. So I think we're very aware of this, how we, 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 we don't know who to trust. Um, so we, we do have to find experts out there that we can trust. And that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. I see, oh, this, this person sounds legitimate to me, even though I'm not a physicist or a mathematician. Um, so I try to post those kinds of, the, the voices I think that are authentic. So, uh, you know, and get feedback on that. I think that, could, that stimulates this, these discourses, discourse events quite a bit. Because in a way, it's, we're tremendously blessed if we can use all this and ground it and amplify it and get feedback. So I'm a, I'm a lumpen proletariat in a lot of ways, but I am uh, very optimistic, even as I'm pessimistic. So anyway, I've said enough. You know, I don't, I don't want to get lost in optimism or pessimism. I do oscillate a little bit in, in, in between, I think, is where I'm most um, alert and aware. So thank you all very much. Yep, thank you. All right, so shall we call it a night? Sweet Why not? <laughs> Thank you all. So I'm, I'm thinking we'll do this again in a month. Okay. And cover whatever, another couple of chapters or so. Um, we're hoping to get through the book by the spring or summer. I don't know how, how it's all going to work out. But um, uh, I'll post the video, audio, and uh, so if you wanted to add anything, something you really wanted to say but slipped your mind, comes back later, you can do so on the thread, uh, and then I'll post a new topic for the next conversation with uh, the Zoom link and everything you need. And um, I mean, t Jamie, you were watching the YouTube video, so that's kind of how you got involved here, and so if anybody else is watching, yeah. uh, just leave a comment get onto the forum and begin 
you know, introduce yourself and uh, begin participating. You could join us. <laughs> and, um, do we need a coordinator to make some uh, an open frame or anything? Did you want to do that? I would love to have a coordinator. If somebody want, would want to volunteer uh, to, to play any kind of support role, uh, that would be fantastic. I should say it's an utterly bizarre experience to step out of the YouTube comments and into the video itself. So, yeah. I look forward to that. <laughs> All right, well, are, are, you, um, are you glad you did? Yeah, definitely. definitely. All right, good. <laughs> Oh, well, um, I actually would, I mean, I'd love to have help, coordination, things like that. I mean, it's fair. It could be self, it's relatively self-organizing if we just have a place to do it. Uh, so that's what the forum has served. Uh, and like we, we did with the Cosmos Cafe uh, events, uh, we hash it out as long as there's, uh, for, you know, reading and, and responding uh, and, um, with with this in particular, though, I think we we have a pattern set, and so we'll right. we'll continue is, until the end of the book. It but, is sort of self organizing. Mm-hmm. That is that. Yeah, but no, like fearless leader. I could fearless. totally I could totally use help on just uh, proposing topics, or um, if there are conversations that come out of this that are tangential to it or, or generated by it. Uh, I don't have to do everything. I mean, you know, just start propose something and ask for help i could help set up a video or the recording or whatever it is i'd like to i'd like to empower other people not that power is coming from me but insofar as i have my fingers on the knobs uh i'd like to make it this a place where people can come in and initiate the kinds of conversations that actually serve their intellectual and spiritual and moral um needs uh and so it is a spherological project in a certain way it doesn't have to be shaped like a a three-dimensional circle i don't care exactly what it's shaped like but in so far as it has a purpose to me the purpose is to to support to provide a supportive container for a kind of discourse that maybe can happen as readily uh in, in other places and it's a little bit messy i'm a little bit messy um but I mean, aren't we all? So, um, so it's good to you know have a, like Heather, you were talking about earlier the um, kind of like a community for the non-communal or something. The uh, that's very tricky, though. I have to say, like the what a we is, what a space is. I, I think it has to be an open inquiry, and it has to be. We just have to be as honest as we can about what it's like because it is very triggering for, for me as well. I mean, I was talking about going to see my dad john you have a particular relationship with your dad it's very different than mine tj you've talked my, about my father's him. dead yeah <laughs> it's a very so, different relationship and, and i mean if we're taking at least what sort of what sort of saying seriously this is not separate from our macro spherological and our communal um engagements so it all comes into play you know in the politics we look for our daddy figures and uh, you know, we want who's going to protect us and who's going to nurture us. So hey, this is not new, but it's real. And it actually comes into play in our interactions. And I think that's that's where it's a little bit scary sometimes for me and also where it gets good. So thanks. Well, yeah. A tangential note on that point you made uh, right at the beginning of a story. I just found it interesting, this the idea of space and distance um in the sort of european context you said it took you four days to get to your dad in a car yeah and that he was you're still in the states and i was thinking four days in a car i could probably get to the turkish syrian border from (laughs) right you you can (laughs) you can probably go between worlds yeah that's that's true when i was first oh no no (laughs) No, the first time i was in the in london friend of mine she says oh well let's go to scotland and i went scotland oh my god isn't that far away and <laughs> she said no we can be there in a few hours and i went really because <laughs> i come from texas you know to get from houston to uh, to, to dallas takes you know eight hours you know so it's really fascinating to me our sense of our sense of scale 
So that was very interesting comment. Yeah. So right. I flashed back on that, how I had to sort of bring everything into kind of a smaller, tighter, tidier way of uh, thinking about space from being, you know, born and raised in the U.S. And hold that thought because that's key to cultural formation too. I bet. Geography and culture as well as nature. Yeah. Big what's top. far what's far away and well that's actually relative isn't it because you know here we are you you do spot that with dialects and sort of regional perceptions as well you must think if you come to the uk you must think you're absolutely bonkers you'll have people who are like oh the the, the people up north they speak different they have a different culture or whatever and they do it goes back hundreds of years but then it, you're talking about a half an hour bus trip <laughs> <laughs> right, right where these different people live you know um, when I uh, I went to the um, Edinburgh Fringe Festival a few years back uh, with a group of people, and one of the people in our group was Canadian, and we told her to prepare for a long train journey, a long journey, and the journey was five hours, and she was like, it's 14 hours on a train to see my grandparents, and we were like, oh, we were, pan after three hours, we were like, get out, get out of the train, oh, God. <laughs> it's so claustrophobic, you know. I think those long, thoughtful trips would make us uh, deeper thinkers. But hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and cabin fever sets in. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you got two girls and a dog, and <laughs> a little Subaru <laughs> packed to the packed to the gills with Christmas paraphernalia. <laughs> I didn't feel like a deeper thinker. <laughs> but uh, then I listened to a bunch of Sam Harris. Uh, and, I don't know if that helped matters or not. That's another discussion for another <laughs> another conversation. <laughs> All right. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you. Right. Good night. Yeah, Thanks for your well poems, done. Doug and John. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, really yeah. well done. Thank you. Yeah. Great to meet you all. And Jamie and uh, Heather, please visit the forum a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we need your help. <laughs> okay. We'll be there. Uh, bye. 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 <laughs>